once a youth enters the criminal justice system, not only does that change their psychological image of themselves, but it also solidifies that within the community because there has been no healing between the community that maybe is harmed and that youth. Aloha Kako, I'm Ashley Lukens, co-director of the Funder Hui. And today we're going to be having a two-part conversation on the future of trauma-informed care here in Hawaii. I'll be joined by Tia Hartsock of the Office of Wellness, but my first guest is Dr. Lorinda Riley. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So I want to start with you. Tell us where you're from. So I consider myself to be from Kahalu'u on the windward side of Oahu. That's where my mother comes from. But um, I was born in Fulda, Germany. So I have had many years um, uh, living abroad and then spent quite a bit of time on the continent going to school as well. And I know that the, your journey towards trauma-informed care began when you were in law school on the continent. So tell us a little bit about your education. Yeah, so I um, went to law school at the University of Arizona, um, and uh, they really focused on Indian law there. And I, part of my ancestry is Native American as well as Native Hawaiian. So I was really interested in exploring that a little bit more. Um, and we had the opportunity there to work with many different tribal nations. And I noticed that a lot of those tribal nations, they have their own judicial system, their own court system, and it incorporated a lot of traditional restorative justice concepts. Restorative justice is a term I think we hear, but a lot of folks don't understand. Can you help me understand what is restorative justice and what is an, it an alternative to? Right, so our um, current justice system in the United States is very punitive. We really focus on um, punishing people for crimes and have this idea that just by putting them in jail, we are somehow rehabilitating them. Restorative justice, on the other hand, really focuses on trying to restore the victim and also ensure that the perpetrator um, has, um, I guess, be reintegrated back into society. So it's really about the healing journey for both parties. So underlying restorative justice, it seems to me, is a thinking about the conditions that led to somebody entering into our justice system. And this leads us to our topic today, which of course is conversations about trauma. Right. So I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about the concept of historical trauma. Sure, sure. I think, well, first I would say there's many different types of trauma. Mm. And I think the one that most people are familiar with is individual trauma. So this is trauma that um, an individual experiences, whether they are a victim of a crime or um, suffered some kind of mental or physical abuse or sexual abuse. So it's a trauma that an individual experiences. Historical trauma is a bit different. Um, it is by its nature collective, so it is perpetrated on a group of people and it usually stems from a mass trauma event such as colonization, genocide, or some of the other things that many indigenous communities experience. It is also cumulative and so it builds up over one's lifetime and across generations. And so somebody who maybe was not alive at the time that colonization originally occurred can still feel the effects and the impacts of that trauma. And it builds up over time so that um, later generations actually carry with them more trauma than former generations. Uh, historical trauma also is unique in the sense that um, it doesn't just deal with things that happened in the past. I think sometimes we get a little bit confused when we hear historical and think it's all in the past, but in reality, it's a term that covers um, modern day racism, whether explicit racism or implicit racism, microaggressions and systemic racism as well. So the guiding theory is that an individual throughout their lifetime experiences all of the pressure and weight 
of these historically rooted dynamics of oppression and trauma. Mm -hmm. And as such, that trauma leads to actions that might land them inside of our justice system. And we have two models. One is this punitive model, and the other is something that you witnessed in Indian country, which is a restorative justice model. So coming back to Hawaii with that experience and knowledge, can you talk about restorative justice here, what you're learning, and maybe where it's being practiced? Sure, it's a big question. <laughs> but I would say that when I came back to Hawaii, I, you know, you, there were people in, working in this area of restorative justice. We see some really great examples. Uh, traditionally, there's Ho'oponopono, which is our traditional peacemaking or way of dealing with conflict. Um, but it really wasn't integrated into our justice system. There's only a few examples that I can think of where uh, restorative practices were integrated into our justice system. And I, I really thought that that was a stark contrast to what I experienced all across Indian country, which Indian country is a legally defined term. But in those um, communities, you really saw the focus being on values of restoring the community, of ensuring that the, not just the individuals were healing, but also that the community was healing from these actions. So here in Hawaii, what do the legacies of historical trauma look like? So recently, um, we did a pilot study where I talked with um, justice involved and at-risk Native Hawaiian youth, as well as service providers. So these are individuals that work directly with these youth, whether they be social workers um, in the judicial system or correctional officers. And it's very interesting to hear what they have to say in terms of how they experience historical trauma. In many ways, it's very similar to what we see in Indian country. Um, that that makes sense because the histories of colonization are similar, but they're not exactly the same. And so we do see some unique differences. For example, uh, many of the youth talk not just about the loss of land and how that impacted them, but the loss of um, use of the land, whether it be access or the environmental damage that has been done through over tourism and the military. When you're navigating these conversations with both correctional officers, but also the youth that are experiencing programs, what types of programs do you feel address the forms of historical trauma that Hawaii's youth uniquely face? Well, this again, we can go straight to the youth and they actually talked about this. Some of the youth that were presently incarcerated um, at Kawailoa Youth and Family Wellness Center, uh, they mentioned just how much strength and healing they get from working the aina. So um, Kawailoa is one of those uh, bright spots in our correctional system that really incorporates restorative justice. Um, and they have a farm where many of those who are incarcerated can go work the aina, pull the weeds, and similarly be pulling some of that anger that they're feeling inside of them out. Um, they also have a livestock program, and so youth are able to um, really feel like somebody else is dependent on them as well and take that responsibility and grow from it. Can you talk a little bit about what's giving you hope right now as you look at some of the shifts that are happening here in Hawaii? Well, honestly, I think that um, just the fact that we have an Office of Wellness and Resilience is amazing. That's one of um, the bright spots. One of the issues with historical trauma and dealing with it is that it's not just one agency in the state that has to address it. It really um, needs a multi-pronged approach. And so having an office that um, oversees and can build the bridges between agencies, I think is, is really positive. I see a lot of momentum too with different um, uh, programs and in fact um, many people within the judicial system, whether it's courts or corrections, there's a lot more interest in restorative justice and so that, that really does um, bring me some hope. Can you talk about the long-term outcome shifts that you can see generally in the field when a youth experiences restorative justice versus 
punitive justice? Are there any trends in the outcomes? I would say that with um, youth that are justice involved, we have a lot of statistics that indicate that it um, has some long-term impacts on them. It can, uh, first of all, they, they're still developing their um, their personalities, their, their brains are still developing. And so when we put them in situations where they're involved in the justice system, it begins to harden who they are. So being able to avoid even getting them into that situation, putting them into programs and other things that um, avoid incarceration is going to have huge benefits in their future. I mean, because I guess I'm trying to get to the greater why. Mm -hmm. like. We know that a punitive criminal justice system oftentimes leads to recidivism and people entering and re-entering the justice system. And so what I'm trying to get at is, you know, what's the hope in the shift, right? I mean, do we hope to keep kids from that healing place out of the system long term? Sure. So I think with uh, restorative justice, um, there's a lot of use of restorative justice in the educational system. And so that is probably one of the first things. Um, unfortunately, we've had a history of youth being uh, put into the justice system because of misbehavior in schools. Mm. So first, having uh, the schools be a place that incorporate restorative justice prevents them from going into the actual criminal justice system. But once a youth enters the criminal justice system, not only does that change their psychological, psychological image of themselves, but it also solidifies that within the community because there has been no healing with, between the community that maybe is harmed and that youth. Um, we also know in the adult population, there's a lot of stigma that is associated be, with being in the criminal justice system. So um, it's often harder to get jobs, um, it's harder to get housing, and that just makes it all the more difficult for these individuals to reintegrate back into the community. Can you talk a little bit about what community healing looks like in the context of restorative justice? Like how might that happen? So I can speak a bit about how this happens in indigenous communities in the continental United States. I had the great fortune of working in the Navajo Nation and they have an amazing peacemaking system. And so whenever there is a crime or you know some kind of action that has hurt another individual, it's um, really an issue between both the perpetrator and the victim and their families. So it's bringing in their families and it's acknowledging that when something happens, it doesn't just impact the individual, it impacts the entire community. And so there needs to be a discussion um, be with that entire community. Oftentimes, um, instead of you know having someone just go sit in a jail cell and think about what they did, um, the perpetrator or the individual who committed this act will have to go and, and, and fix the wrong that they committed, whether if they graffitied, maybe they have to repaint the house that they graffitied, but that restores that relationship um, back to what it was hopefully in the future. So tell me a little bit about the findings of your current research. Sure, so when we interviewed these justice-involved Native Hawaiian youth and um, service providers, we found that um, in comparison to Native American communities, there was a lot of overlap. Um, however, there were some really strong differences, and I think those differences really speak to the colonial history and legacies of Native Hawaiians. And um, one of the things that was really interesting was that all the Native Hawaiian youth felt pride about being Native Hawaiian. Mm. They, uh, many of them had gone through the Kayapuni schools, they could Olelo Hawaii, and they really drew strength from that. Um, but not all of them had that same opportunity. So programs that really um, focus on rebuilding and reinstilling pride in community, um, language learning, dancing hula, uh, practicing lua for the kane, you know, those are programs that are going to um, be sources of strength in times of crisis. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about what the symptoms of historical trauma look like? 
Absolutely. There's been some amazing research in historical trauma. And in fact, historical trauma theory um, really originated as a way to explain why the descendants of the survivors of the Holocaust were experiencing negative impacts, even though they themselves did not experience genocide. Um, and out of that, uh, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart did some research and applied it to the indigenous communities, mm -hmm. um, largely within her own community in the Great Plains Lakota Nation. Um, and then other researchers uh, developed a scale, the historical loss scale, historical loss associated symptom scale, as a way to measure historical trauma within Native American communities. And many of the symptoms of historical trauma are things like, that are, we associate with PTSD. Mm -hmm. It's anxiety, depression, rage, a lot of substance abuse, feeling of um, being disconnected from uh, your community, your family, and a lot of those disconnections occurred because of government policies, such as um, Indian boarding schools, um, or broken treaties, or um, having to live on reservations. So um, those are some of the symptoms that we see in Indian country. Um, and again, here in Hawaii, there is quite a bit of overlap, but at the same time, there are a lot of differences, you know, because we don't live on reservations, you know, we, we don't really think of our educational system as being a, a boarding school system. Um, and so the scale itself, or the way to measure historical trauma, doesn't work very well in our community. Using those metrics that were sort of derived on the mainland. Right. Yes. And so they actually have tried to apply that scale here in Hawaii. And it, it, it works, but it doesn't quite operate quite the same way. And in fact, they've had to remove certain questions because it just didn't make sense here. Um, but of course, um, with some of the work that I've done, we see that there is quite a bit of overlap. Maybe it's just a matter of changing the questions, maybe um, adding in questions about environmental damage, over tourism, and things like that. And that would allow us to be able to measure historical trauma um, amongst Native Hawaiians and allow us to better uh, develop uh, interventions that would be able to address this issue and really promote the healing in this community. Because in the long run, I think what I'm hearing both from the understanding of historical trauma as these accumulated structural impacts of displacement and pain and colonization, uh, when that understanding is guiding the solutions, we start to see less children and youth ending up engaged in our criminal justice system. But we also see the communities around that youth and the future generations of those communities healing simultaneously. And that's an amazing point because what we saw um, was that many youth are experiencing historical trauma, but they have they have family members that are dealing with the same thing. In fact, there were some youth who shared that their parents would never go to their school, would never speak up for them, because every time they went there, it reminded them of their schooling mm -hmm. experience. And so they really were disengaged. And so of course that you know just perpetuates um, the, the trauma that the entire community is feeling. Mm -hmm. Are there programs that you can point to that the community might get involved with to support sort of this broader um, healing, even if they themselves are not engaged in the criminal justice system? Absolutely, there's a lot of programs that I, I think address um, healing in the community. And oftentimes it's individuals, dedicated individuals that are members of the community, they see a need and so they just go out and do it. But a lot of Malama Aina programs working with the Aina Programs that you know really bring the community together, um, I think, are beneficial. And then programs that focus on building back that cultural strength. Um, many of these cultural factors are protective factors and things that we turn to when we're um, under stress. And so the more that we're able to build up these cultural practices, the better. 
And I think also, you know, we think of this as a native Hawaiian topic mm -hmm. and issue, but really many of these things, malama aina, it can benefit everyone. Uh, so many people, whether you're Hawaiian or not, enjoy being out on the land, enjoy working in the lo'i and get a lot of satisfaction from that. Yeah, I can imagine that many other youth that are non-native Hawaiian but engaged in our criminal justice system can appreciate yes. the cultural values that come with connection to land, connection to another person, mm -hmm. and sort of collect connection to something higher than themselves, whether that be their culture. Um, I really appreciate you joining us here today. Um, we'll be right back with a conversation with Tia Hartsock from the Office of Wellness and Resilience. Thanks so much. Welcome back. Again, we're here discussing the future of trauma-informed care in Hawaii. And my second guest is the newly inaugurated Director of Wellness and Resilience. Welcome, Tia Hartsock. Tia, tell me a little bit about the history of this office. It's very rare when you see a new administrative body form inside of a state. Yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. This has been a long uh, process of so many uh, people coming together to determine the best um, move forward with the state as it relates to uh, working with trauma survivors as the mental health needs kind of um, continue to expand, um, especially highlighted and expanded by COVID. Uh, there was in 2021 uh, legislative action that was taken to develop Act 209. And Act 209 is the Trauma-Informed Care Task Force that has been meeting for the last uh, couple of years to develop a statewide framework of how trauma-informed care is going to be implemented throughout the state. And so uh, this is looking, this task force has been really looking at how uh, to address uh, the, the systemic reform that relates to trauma-informed care practices, trying to determine how to acknowledge uh, and look at historical trauma as well, um, looking at how cultural practices and practitioners can um, inform some of the pieces that we're putting together to create this framework in, in how to implement trauma-informed care throughout the state. And from that task force, um, the, the thought came about to uh, really look at how to sustain this, this, this recommendations report, this framework of trauma-informed care in the state. And instead of with task forces, instead of like looking at doing all of this amazing work and then putting it up on a shelf, uh, the, the brilliance of many people came together and, and decided to put together legislation that got introduced last year to create an Office of Wellness and Resilience. And amazingly, with so much community support, we were able to get it established, um, get it funded with six positions. Uh, I just got appointed in December, started in January, and uh, I'm now looking uh, to, to implement part of the framework as well as a bunch of different other pieces in the Act 291 legislation uh, that is that outlines the purpose and function of the Office of Wellness and Re Re Resilience. It's housed in the office of the governor, so we will um, we are housed there on at the Capitol to uh, to do this work and embark on this you know continued process of creating a trauma informed Hawaii. Can you tell me a little bit about what kinds of organizations and agencies were originally engaging in creating first the task force and then ultimately helping drive legislation to form the office? Sure, so the Act 209 task force legislation outlined 11 agencies that uh, are member agencies to be at the table to discuss and create this framework, to define what trauma is for Hawaii, to look at cultural practices that are effective and building upon um, resilience within the state. And those 11 state agencies and, and nonprofits and community organizations have been meeting. Um, they, they include you know, depart major departments, Department of Health, Department of Education, uh, the Judiciary, Department of Human Services, um, uh, office, uh, Executive Office on Early Learning, um, and then some nonprofits. We are Oceania. I'm looking at the, um, at the, the members of uh, the um, Compact uh, for Free Association, the COFA migrants, representing, um, represented by We Are Oceania, as well as 
Hawaii Youth Services Network representing the nonprofits. Law enforcement is uh, on the on the um, task force, uh, and there's a couple Kamehameha schools, a couple other agencies that are uh, meeting on a monthly basis. We are also so lucky to have the engagement of multiple community members representing different nonprofits and state agencies. So as we meet monthly, there is, I, I was the chair, um, Department of Health is now chair um, since I've gotten uh, in the Office of Wellness and Resilience. And from any, on any month call, we have uh, between 30 and 80 community members attending to participate in this development and help inform the way in which this framework is getting put together. So was the sense of the departments who were originally engaged in convening the task force and ultimately those agencies that are now engaged in the implementation of the framework, did they do this from a place that the current programs were failing to impact the youth that they were trying to serve? Was there a sense that we had to do something different and that difference was starting to recognize trauma? So, you know, the, the, impetus, the impetus of this um, has been happening for a while. Um, the, the trauma that is pervasive throughout our communities has really been, um, uh, we've been looking at it from a community perspective, from a state perspective, um, from a nonprofit, even a federal perspective, on how to best address the needs of people and through mental health treatment, through, through community partnerships, uh, e even with the reform efforts across the state with, uh, within the departments, and, and I failed to mention um, the Department of Public Safety, which is um, Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation now, um, really looking at all the efforts that have been going on within the state and how to better coordinate that um, to address trauma survivors. So all of these agencies are agencies that are working with youth and their families uh, who are trauma survivors and trying to improve the way in which um, we we respond to that to the needs so the biggest things with trauma-informed care is we don't want to trigger and we don't want to re-traumatize so people that are in the systems uh, people that are experiencing trauma prior to getting to systems and then unfortunately there are situations where the systems that we are trying to better end up re-traumatizing and triggering. So the real effort across the country for the last 15 years with trauma-informed care is trying to acknowledge the presence and, the, and the, uh, the pervasiveness of trauma, to understand what it does to brain development, how it impacts the way in which our, um, our, our brain thinks, how it impacts the way that we, we respond to environmental stimulus, um, how we respond to traumatic stress and really help the workforce, um, not only the ones who are providing the service, the recipients of the service, but the ones that are providing the service as well, to help the whole system um, better uh, approach people who are survivors of trauma, create policies and programs that will um, like concretely try and change the way that we look at behaviors and get to the root cause of oftentimes what we see overrepresented in our systems, this, this, this lifetime of complex experiences that are trauma-based. Hmm. So what I'm thinking about is as an individual is engaging our systems now that we are moving towards a trauma-informed state, that we're gonna start to see the implementation of practices that begin with empathy and compassion for the conditions that led that individual into the office? So that would be ideal, right? We want to be able to come at this, um, at, at trauma survivors and, and those of us who have experienced community traumas, like COVID has been a, quite a large community trauma. Um, and to be able to come at it with this curiosity, this empathetic curiosity of, instead of what is wrong with you? You know, this, this concept of like, oh, this child is bouncing off the walls and, and can't sit still and can't concentrate and focus. So the education around what trauma um, experiences, traumatic experiences does 
to the way we're able to concentrate, how we're able to learn, how we're able to remember what we've just mm -hmm. learned, is really impacted um, on, uh, in what happens to us on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we change the language and change the approaches from, what is wrong with you? Uh, why are you acting like this? To this curious, empathetic approach of, I wonder what's happening with this child. What's, ha what's going on with you? Let's talk about it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have to do that, you know, because that takes time and that takes energy and that for teachers and for social workers and for people in the helping profession, oftentimes we hear, I'm not a therapist, you know, or I'm not a, um, a mental health professional to be able to open that and then know how to close that up. But just the empathetic listening can be a huge, huge benefit um, to feel connected. I mean, you were talking about earlier on uh, how we're able to, as humans, uh, heal when we connect. Mm. And so the connection, um, emotional connection, uh, is a huge, huge benefit, just even with empathetic listening, that can help somebody start and, and continue through the process of healing. Mm. So I've, we spoke a little bit with Dr. Riley about how trauma-informed care um, would support our criminal justice system. I'm hearing a little bit about how it might show up in education. Where else do you see the Office of Wellness and Resilience really focusing their work? Um, so trauma-informed care, you know, is, is, is a strategy. Um, and the principles in practice can be used as strategies everywhere. So. Uh, it's, the, it's the way in which we're able to um, look and see how, like say for example in the child welfare system, looking at child welfare reform and understanding the processes of what are in practice of removing children, mm -hmm. of identifying abuse, of responding with police, in the questions that we ask, in the way in which we um, elicit stories versus you know, going question by question by question what kind of environment we create for those families and youth that are experiencing sometimes the worst day of their life. Mm. And when we encounter them to know that this is, this, this is one of the worst days of these people's lives, how do we come at this with, um, uh, with this empathetic approach to be curious and create safety, um, help with predictability. So in our systems, it's very hard to navigate for families and youth and, and to know what's coming next. If I call them, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna trigger this event? It, are the police gonna show up? What's gonna happen when they show up? Um, so even a trauma-informed kind of principle like predictability, uh, providing information, just say for example in COVID, uh, one of the reasons why it was uh, has such lasting impacts now is because of the amount of anxiety of unknown in the community of what was gonna happen next. And so one of the strategies is when we can provide as much predictability as possible and, and dose the information regularly around this, this is one way, we're not gonna predict the future, but to be able to help provide information on a regular basis of what's happening next. So in child welfare, for example, or, or the court systems, um, to be able to say, so first, this person's going to show up and then and, and repeat it because when we're stressed, right, we have a hard time remembering. So the repetition of language and messaging, um, the repetition uh, of our of the steps that are going to happen, who's going to be in contact with you, when that's going to happen, what they're going to do, all of that helps with reducing anxiety and can help the experience to not be so traumatic. Mm. So I'm hearing that trauma-informed care is a set of strategies that agencies and processes can start to use to center the individuals going through those processes. And I'm hearing child welfare now is another one. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other processes involved in trauma-informed care or the strategies that you see folks starting to adopt either here in Hawaii mm -hmm. or nationwide? Yeah, great question. Uh, one of the favorite, one of my favorite things to kind of uplift around uh, trauma-informed care strategies and principles is the concept of peer supports um, and utilizing people with lived experience in the system to inform practice. 
So having somebody who's experienced uh, system involvement in the child welfare system or the criminal justice system or the mental health system uh, and, and have their voice be at the table. So voice and choice are a big thing in trauma-informed care and so is peer support. So getting people in, the, in our systems that have experienced it, getting their feedback on it, getting their input, but also getting them to be one of the first points of contact with a family and a, or a youth within the system so that somebody looks like them, somebody understands what this experience might be, might feel like, and they can be able to connect with them um, uh, and engage with them um, and help them through this system by answering questions on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. This is a huge trauma-informed care principle. Mm. It, seems, it seems not obvious, but it seems so compelling and so ground-shifting. Um, and it's amazing that you were able to get both the task force and now an office through the legislature. What has the pushback been? Why are people skeptical of trauma-informed care? Where's the resistance showing up? So I think, you know, when, when we're looking at asking people to change behavior, the same way that in our systems we ask people to change their behavior, we ask clients to change their behavior on a daily basis. Um, so when we're asking people to do work a different way or to engage with even each other in a different way, um, it, it is common, some of it is very much common sense. Uh, but some of the pushback, you know, I, I believe um, we've, we've gotten a little bit pushback, but I think COVID's really helped um, collectively acknowledge that, okay, it's not just those people over there that are experiencing this. This is everyone. And we all now, better understand, unfortunately, uh, what it feels like to operate in prolonged exposure to stress and this like, prolonged exposure to the unpredictability, the new strands, this new way of transmitting, how long will it take? You know, all of these pieces can um, impact the way that we show up on a daily basis. And so some of the resistance is just around like, is this going to be more that I'm going to have to do? Is this just more work for me. So the engagement really looks at, uh, is a huge step, um, and the education around that when we institute some of this, you see in different, uh, in different jurisdictions what, where trauma-informed care has been instituted, you see incidences decrease. You see engage in involvement in systems decline. You see anxiety and depression decline, and the behaviors that, uh, that are, um, and that uh, are surround those um, uh, those needs. So you see things in, especially in the criminal justice system, like um, the sanctuary model. Uh, when those pieces are implemented, you'll see decrease in the negative things that we don't want to be seeing in public. One perfect example um, of implementing trauma-informed care in our systems, I believe, uh, we just last July got to zero girls incarcerated in Hawaii. One of the first uh, countries in the nation that has um, finally got our numbers down to zero girls incarcerated um, at the at the Kavailoa Youth and Wellness uh, Family Wellness Center, um, the youth correctional facility, and I believe, and many of uh, the folks that have worked on that effort for years, uh, the way in which trauma informed care has been implemented throughout the system, starting with the development of Girls Court, which was a very a gender specific trauma informed approach to programming to get at the root causes of trauma. Why are the girls running? Why are, why are they truant? Why do they keep getting uh, you know, um, probation violations from um, statutory offenses? Um, and so, so these are pieces that we're looking at um, implementing gender specific and trauma informed programs through the courts and replicating that throughout the system through collaboration, through creating peer supports, through empowering voice and choice in the system uh, has, has all been this larger effort to decrease girls being incarcerated. Yeah, I, I was had the opportunity to visit Pearl Haven on the North Shore of Oahu and really saw their trauma-informed approach to helping young girls who had been trafficked and it felt so obvious to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, an 11 year old doesn't choose to engage in prostitution, doesn't choose to 
um, get wrapped up in all of the forms of criminality that su- support um, right. the trafficking of girls. And yet, so often those girls are the ones who end up inside of the criminal justice system for the sort of tertiary behaviors that happen. And Hawaii was one of the highest, we had one of the highest incarceration rates about 15 years ago uh, of incarcerating um, juveniles for um, probation violations uh, that initially started with um, running away, truancy. So we saw a lot of girls getting, um, because we were trying to keep them safe. So it was the system that was responding with, with good intent the judges were responding to to do their best to keep these girls safe and with the lack of programming that we had at that time um, we didn't want them going to Waikiki and getting involved in sex trafficking and getting involved in drug abuse and getting involved in in um, you know what we see with criminal behavior down there because we see that trajectory um, so implementing um, practices with trauma-informed care within that system and and really understanding why they were running and what they were running from mm. and how to create connections. Girls are very relational, right? So creating connections with other people um, and, and building that ability for them to, to think in their mind and feel in their hearts that they are not alone in the trauma that they experience and that they are not defined by these unfortunate traumatic events that ha- they've experienced as children. So being able to connect with other girls their age that have experienced similar um, events uh, helps them feel like they're part of something, helps them feel connected, and helps them through that healing process. One of the things that Dr. Riley talked to us about is like how central community healing is um, in the process of restorative justice. I'm wondering how your office is going to be engaging with the community. So we are really, you know, we're really trying to look at it as this, um, this our, our continued efforts that have been happening for several years now with many system partners, many community organizations and grassroots efforts around how to identify what's working, how to identify how communities are resilient, how to identify the strengths of each community and build, uplift those and build upon those and really replicate them um, for populations that are disproportionately represented in our systems. I mean, that is the big effort to get the disproportionate representation and start to re-engage um, with communities to, as Dr. Riley alluded to and, and mentioned was, um, this is not just one, the state should not be um, the only solution, right? It should be part of the solution, but better engaging with community, um, with champions in the communities, with cultural practitioners who are doing and, and, and leading efforts that have been successful for years, um, building upon those and learning from them is going to be um, a, a huge focus of the office. Mm. And I love that you're sort of going where you started, which is with the very communities that organize to create this office, um, to get it funded. I know you've been down at the legislature, so congrats, and I'm hoping for some big wins this year. Thanks so much for joining us, Tia. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks again for joining us. Again, I'm Ashley Lukens, the director of Funder Hui, and I want to thank the UH Better Tomorrow Speaker Series for hosting us here today and our sponsors, uh, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Hawaii Community Foundation, Kamehameha Schools, and again, uh, the Office of Wellness and Resilience. Thanks so much.